Good morning. This is my name is Roxanne Ryan Alazier. I'm a managing director working for the chief development officer. I would like to thank you for participating in today's disability um, virtual town hall. The purpose of this event is to reach out to partners that we have globally who have disability inclusive um, organizations so that we can hopefully share with you the products and services that DFC offers. I would like to get this conversation started by introducing my manager, um, the chief development officer, Andrew Herskovitz, so that he can say a few words welcoming you. Great. Thanks so much, Roxanne. Thanks so much for organizing this event. And thanks to all the participants as well. Um, first, apologies for the technical difficulties that caused us to be a bit delayed. We still have some speakers who are trying to get in, and so hopefully that will happen as well. Um, my name is Andy Herskowitz. I'm the Chief Development Officer at the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. I also want to thank the U.S. embassies worldwide who've been working with us to try to identify companies to participate in this event. Uh, DFC is the U.S. government's development finance institution. Uh, our role is to try to advance development and foreign policy goals through the use of development finance. Many of you may be familiar with the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC, as well as USAID's Development Credit Authority, which were the predecessor uh, agency and program that we had um, before the creation of DFC. But DFC was created for a different reason. Um, OPIC was, was heavily focused on helping mitigate the risks of U.S. investors who are making overseas investments still had development impact, but generally uh, there was a re requirement that there would be a U.S. nexus with every one of the investments. But that's changed with the creation of DFC, and it's one of the reasons that we're talking to all of you today, because we no longer have that U.S. nexus requirement, and the mandate of DFC is to advance development and foreign policy uh, in the first instance. And one of the ways that we do that is trying to build local capacity in the countries where we operate. It also has to do with us focusing in low income and lower middle income countries, and also focusing on the poorest and most marginalized populations in those countries as well. And so one of the things that we've been undertaking is doing a series of these business development roundtables or town halls, trying to identify companies worldwide where we as the US government can partner with local companies and local countries as well. The US government's model of development is different than the model of development for others in that we really are looking for long-term trading partners, we're looking for long-term sustainability, and we're looking to empower the partners in the countries where we're operating. Um, part of doing really good development is making sure that that involves inclusive development. And, and so to that end, one of the things that we've been undertaking are a series of these business roundtables focusing on populations who often do get left behind or who are left out. And that includes LGBTQ, um, it includes persons with disabilities, indigenous um, uh, peoples. And so, so we're, we're, we're looking to try to expand and diversify our client base. Uh, just to give you a sense, in the past with OPIC, the majority of the business was with just a handful of clients. But with DFC, we've really uh, attempted to significantly expand our client base and diversify it. And we've already added, I know in our first two years, at least 70 new clients. So I'm hoping that as a result of this conversation, we could look for opportunities to collaborate with all of you uh, and your companies as well. And also just one thing I want to add as well is that inclusivity doesn't just have to do with the client, the nature of uh, what group the client may fall into, but making sure that all clients are adopting policies that promote inclusivity as well. So we look forward to working with you. And again, I turn it back over to you, Roxanne. Thank you so much for those meaningful remarks. Um, I'd also like to introduce to you uh, Michelle Zarniak. Michelle Zarniak is a member of the Biden administration of the Biden administration. She is our deputy chief of staff. She will be providing some remarks about today's event as well. Michelle. Great. Thank you, Roxanne. Good morning, everyone. Um, I know that we are working through a few um, kind of technical issues, but thank you so, so much um, to the team that has coordinated this event. Um, and thank you so much for sticking with us uh, and, and logging in from wherever you are around the world. Um, so, as Roxanne mentioned, um, my name is Michelle Zarniak. I'm the deputy chief of staff here at, at uh, the Development Finance Corporation. I'm super thrilled to be able to join you this morning uh, and to see so many potential partners joining us on the line. Um, 
Thank you, Andy, for uh, your your great remarks. And, and I know that we are also working hard to get a very, very um, special speaker on here who, who we're super, super excited about. So uh, we'll keep working through that. Um, and uh, I, I did want to mention, um, you know, a couple of stats that you may uh, or may not find surprising. So one, according to the Global Poverty Project, an estimated 1 billion individuals live with a disability and 80% of whom are based in the developing world. Um, additionally, 90% of the individuals in the developing world do not attend school, and that makes the link between disability and poverty particularly strong. So those are very powerful numbers to hear. Um, I do want to share that you know, the administration has responded to disability issues in the United States with a plan to commit $400 billion in the home and community-based services, which we believe will help people with disabilities live more independently. Moreover, the administration has called on Congress to eliminate sub-minimum wage provisions that often keep people with disabilities from getting good jobs with fair wages. And more broadly, the Biden administration has stated that it will work with, uh, it will work to ensure that the dignity and rights of disabled individuals are lifted up in every policy developed, both in the U.S. and abroad. So to that end, DFC is working to ensure that disability inclusion figures strongly into how we measure the development impact of our transactions and ultimately uh, the impact on end beneficiaries and potential clients, potential partners uh, like you. So with great thanks to all that you see here on the line um, that's helped to kind of pull this together, today is our first effort to outreach directly to either founders and owners who have a disability um, or to companies that are making disability inclusiveness an integral part of their organization's employment strategy. Uh, and so lastly, I'll just kind of close uh, and, and share that DFC plans to launch a disability lens training uh, to ensure our own team here, our investment officers, um, have the tools needed to identify and underwrite transactions that support disability inclusiveness. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor back over to Roxanne uh, and thanks again. Thank you so much. Again, thank you so much everyone for all of your um, I guess the word would be support as well as your patience as we've worked through some of the technical issues that we've had this morning. Um, I do want to, to see if we can, um, are we ready to bring our special guest on or do we need to move forward? Move forward for one moment. Okay, all right, so what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna spend, one of the things I, we want to do with today's event is we wanna take the time to share a little bit about what the DFC is, how it works, Unmute Roxanne, unmute, unmute. Okay, so I think, okay, so just so that you know what, what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna take a little bit of time to understand a little bit about who the DFC is. Some of you may not be familiar with the DFC, um, the Development Finance Corporation, and so I wanna share a little bit about who we are, what we do in terms of how we work, and then what is it like to work with the DFC? Next slide. So the, the DFC, as Andy mentioned, is a new organization. Um, we were once the OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Um, our goal is really to invest with private sector partners in order to advance the interests of American people. So to give you some context, in terms of what Andy said, he's absolutely right that in the past, we were really working to mitigate the risks that U.S. businesses had, even as we tried to approach um, development impact. I think now what we've been able to do is further underscore our commitment to development impact, um, and form policy um, and ensure that the projects that we have really do a good job of kind of lifting all boats. Um, I think it's critical that, you know, we speak to the fact that under this administration, there's been a real commitment and focus on kind of broad based economic development and DFC completely aligns with that goal. Next slide. So, what's unique about the way the DFC operates is that it's really focused on private 
private sector investment. So that means that we will do outreach like the kinds that we're doing now, but our real focus is on bringing in businesses and really giving them the capital and in some instances, the technical assistance they need to grow, whether that be through loans, loan guarantees, insurance, or equity. We've really made a commitment to prioritize low income and low middle income countries. So in the past, I would say maybe 60% of what we did was in low income and low middle income countries. We've now grown that amount and I think we're closer to about 69 to 70 percent, which I think is very exciting given the fact that, you know, we are a new organization. We also make sure that all of our invest investments have really strong environmental and social standards. Next slide. But we're not alone. Right, so DFC is part of a larger US government and and I'll talk with you a little bit about who those various partners are. The 1st is the state department. Some of those individuals are with us today and they lead with diplomacy, whether that be political economic diplomacy, working with local governments to ensure really strong partnerships. USAID, that's the US Agency for International Development. That's the group that really works a lot on issues related to humanitarian um, issues, social programs that work in many low and lower middle income countries. Then there's the middle, then there's the Millennial Challenge Corporation. So that organization is really focused on strengthening um, local um, economic environments and really changing policy environments so that they can be more integrated into the global economy. And then, of course, there's what we do, which is really focused on private sector investment. Next slide. And there are, there are five investment priorities, and I'm going to talk about these here. Um, the first is climate. So one of the commitments that we've made as an organization is to show is to ensure that about 30% of our investments go into go into supporting both climate adaptation and climate mitigation. One of our goals is to make sure that we hit a net zero um, a net zero goal of by 2020. Um, I think that this has become like a really clear issue. I think the recent events with weather, et cetera, has certainly made it clear to us that this is a goal that you know we must pursue as an organization. Global health. Um, I think in terms of global health, it's become really clear to us that, you know, in, in, as it relates to this most recent pandemic, it, there's been a real kind of an awareness that we've all had about the challenges that most health most healthcare systems have along their value chain. So what this organization has done is that it has really, I, I, I must say, I think we've grown our commitment more than 200 by by more than 200 percent to ensure that. Um, you know, all along the value chain, we are strengthening um, our investments. Moreover, we're making increased investments in water, food security, as well as digital health as a means to strengthen the global health care chain. Um, the third area is uh, gender equity. So gender equity has always been something that we've been concerned about, but moreover, we've really made a deeper effort to make sure that we are intentional about advancing women's economic empowerment, recognizing that we see women as an accelerator. Investments in women often mean investments in families, investments in local communities, um, and you know, very often they are uh, excluded from access, but when they are, the when they do get access, the impacts can be tremendous. Internet connectivity and technology. This is another area that DFC has been pretty commit committed to, to really expanding access to underserved communities. Part of the rationale for that is that by providing affordable access, it becomes an accelerator that gives people access to either digital banking or to online learning or access to telemedicine, which means that just by having access to the internet, someone can become more integrated into the global con economy and get access to other services that they need. And then in terms of inclusive growth, this is a perfect example of that, that you know, we're really making sure that, that all of our investments are focused not only on you know, growing uh, 
growing uh, the, the middle class, but also making sure that we really tap into communities that have been marginalized, whether they're women, female, whether it's women, whether it's members of the LGBTQ community, whether it's other marginalized groups or members of the disabled community, not just as groups that we serve, but also as groups that are integrated into their local economies and have the opportunities to become pr producers. Next slide. Okay, and so, you know, I think it's safe to say that, you know, DFC continues to focus on growing our impact. So it's not so much just about growing the amount of money that we invest. So one of the things you should know is that when we were OPIC, we had a cap of about 30 billion. That's now grown to $60 billion. But our goal isn't just about the money, it's about making sure that we reach a larger percentage of people than we reached before, with now with the goal of reaching 30 million people um, pri by prioritizing job creation, um, by prioritizing the ex expansion of our client base, and by prioritizing um, women in underserved communities. Next slide. And just to give you a little bit of a, a sense of where we work and how we work, um, this has actually begun to be a bit outdated, but our total um, portfolio is about $33 billion. As you can see, it's pretty diverse, the areas that we work in. So there are, we do quite a bit in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, but we also are continuing to invest in Indo-Pacific and Eurasia. And as you can see, we also have a robust set of projects that impact a variety of regions. I think one of the key things that I always think is interesting about this is even though, you know, we do these great big infrastructure projects, 75% of us, 75, 70 to 80% of our investments are actually smaller projects. So that means projects that are under $50 million. Um, and I think it's that effort that we're trying to expand on as well. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so let me talk you through a little quickly what kinds of products we offer. So the product that many of you, if you are familiar with DFC at all, that you're probably gonna be familiar with is debt financing. Debt financing falls into two categories, direct loans and investment guarantees. So DFC can provide a direct loan or investment guarantee for up to $1 million billion. I would say the numbers tend to be, our median tends to be closer to maybe 15 or 10 to 20. Um, and we can go as long as as 25 years, although again, the, the actual medium may be much shorter than that. Um, direct loans are very similar to a car loan or mortgage loan that you would have, but direct loans are really critical because they're the lifeblood of any business. The ability to be able to access a loan for expansion purposes or for growth per or to be able to invest in um, start working in a new region or to diversify your products and services. Um, in terms of investment guarantees, investment guarantees are a tool that we often use with local banks. We recognize that most economies, when they are strong, it's because their local banking sector is strong and is lending to small and medium enterprises. So we're able to provide pretty long tenors, tenors that ten, tenors mean the life of that loan. We're able to provide, you know, pretty long tenors um, and good size um, investment. In, uh, investment support where we will provide a guarantee where we're either going to split the cost if there's a default or we'll take on maybe the first 70 percent of um, a default if something of that nature occurs what that means is that for a local bank who may feel a little less comfortable investing or, or supporting um, a small medium enterprise this helps to de-risk the challenges that that local bank will face. Um, it means that they will feel more comfortable um, maybe supporting a woman-owned business, a small and medium enterprise, a, biz a, a business for um, or in a rural area, or a business that supports a marginalized community. Um, I think the other thing that DFC does that um, I'm going to jump around a little bit is provide political risk insurance. So we recognize that in many of the markets that we serve, people feel really maybe uncomfortable. So what we are able to do is provide um, insurance where we protect the assets in case of something like currency and convertibility. 
or government interference or political violence. So when we talk about currency and convertibility as an example, it really refers to an instance where um, someone invests there from another country and then they work in the local currency, but then they also have to repay their investors locally. So there are instances where maybe the national government may make it a little difficult for someone to be able to take the money out so that they can then pay back their investors. So one of the things that DFC does, it helps to protect assets in those kinds of situations. The other thing that DFC does is it often works with a number of its partners, whether that be aid or USAID or at the State Department to really work with the local government and talk with them about how you know those kinds of activities often hurt um, that country's ability to impact foreign direct investment. And that often can be a very comforting thing to a business owner and can also be very helpful ensuring that you know, we continue to grow the local economy. Then we have a couple of new products that we didn't have before. I would say equity investments and investment funds fall into that category. Now we did have investment funds, but we had a quasi equity product. Now we have a, a full equity product that enables us to do two things. Either if anyone is familiar with how equity works, you have what are called general partners. They may raise money through limited partners. Um, and then they take the money and they invest in a variety of what are called portfolio companies. They help those companies to be successful. And then when those companies have an exit, meaning they sell or they decide to buy back the company, then in those instances, that's how the general partner makes money. And then that's how they're able to pay their limited partners. What DFC can do now is it can be um, a limited partner and help to provide and provide equity to a general partner. This is critical because very often it is very, very difficult for general partners who want to support and help to grow companies in emerging markets to get access to capital. It also helps us to support portfolio companies um, so that they can also access growth capital when, when and if they need it. The other thing that we can provide now that we couldn't provide in the past is technical assistance. So I think technical assistance is a wonderful thing because many before when we operated as um, DFC, as, as OPIC, we would see these great projects, but we would notice note that, you know, there are instances where if they just had technical assistance dollars, we would be able to increase the commercial viability of the project or developmental impact of the project. So now one of the the things that we can do is provide technical assistance. So those are dollars that are provided fairly early on in the project's life or throughout the project or at another stage in the project's life to ensure either its com commercial viability or the or to include it improve its development impact. Um, feasibility studies kind of fits in with that to just make sure that the project can be commercially and developmentally viable. Next slide. And please let us know if you're having any difficulty at all seeing the, um, the interpreters. It's really important that you're able to see them. Okay, so let me talk you through a little, let me talk you through the project life cycle. So one of the questions that we often get is, gee, I'm really interested in having my project supported by the DFC. How long does it take for me to get financing? Well, I think the answer is it depends. So as I mentioned, we have larger projects. Those are projects between 50 million and $1 billion. Those projects tend to be fairly complex. They're infrastructure projects, um, telecommunications projects, energy projects. Those projects usually take at least a year, if not much longer in order to get financed, really because of the complexity of those projects. Smaller projects that are between 20 to $50 million or that are under $20 million, we can actually get done in less than a year. And if they're under $20 million, maybe even less than six months. Um, so it really depends on a couple things. It depends on the complexity of the project. It depends on the responsiveness and the sophistication of the specific client, like your ability to answer the questions that we have. And it depends on 
really you know, just the availability of investment officers to kind of really work through the process. But one of the things we try to do is prioritize those projects that we believe have the best chances of getting executed. And so we start the process by sourcing, doing things like we're doing now, outreach events, um, follow up phone calls, et cetera, in order to help people to learn a little bit about what DFC does. And then what will happen is investment officers like the one you're going to hear from now, Dia Martin, may pre screen a project, talk with you, kind of get a sense for what your business plan is, review your feasibility report, and then have a conversation with you know, members of their team. And in that conversation, they'll kind of look at this project, see about you know, the development impact of the project, the um, kind of get a sense for the, the credit capabilities of the, the, the credit applicability of the project. They'll take a look at whether it meets DFC's eligibility requirements um, and then kind of see how this project fits with, you know, the other projects that we have in our pipeline. You know, once that's done, and if we say, hey, this is actually a project we think we can do, we'll ask you to complete an application. We'll do things like check for your, your project's credit worthiness. We're really going to be spending a lot of time looking at the development impact. And Lori Leonard later on will explain what that will look like. Then we're going to talk about, due, then we're going to do due diligence. That's our process for kicking the tires and really making sure that this is a well managed organization operationally, that it is is a really thoughtful organization in terms of its financials, take a look at your financial assumptions to make sure that they're smart, and then really get a sense for, you know, whether you have the ability to execute on the development goals that you've articulated. Then we're going to start the approval process. So the great thing is if a project is under $20 million, the process is pretty straightforward. We have a meeting with the local team and then there's it's evaluated by um, our credit policy team. If a project is between 20 to $50 million, then they're going to be, there's going to be additional layer of going to the um, office of uh, investment. We're going to have a, a meeting with the investment committee, which is a series of leaders throughout the organization who are really going to evaluate and dig into the, the details of the project. But for projects that are much larger, meaning 50 million to, to 1 billion, I've mentioned those before, those are going to go to the board of directors. Please note, because equity is a new product, equity projects of any size is going to go through the most rigorous process and will go to the board. Um, and then the project moves towards close and then towards monitoring. But again, it's really driven by project complexity, your responsiveness, and then really, you know, and oftentimes, you know, the other things that we have in the queue, but it really has to do with the um, industry that you're in, the complexity of the project, and your own responsiveness. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about what it's like to work with DFC. So I think, you know, you're all going to get access to these presentations, but I think what's helpful for you to know is to think about how DFC thinks about the projects that it, that it has. And, you know, as you can see here, we're all, we are going to look at whether the project makes financial sense. So does the project, is the project new or is it an expand or do you need money for expansion capital? Um, have you made any, do you have any money in the project? So we tend to ask for people to have at least 20 to 30% um, equity to put into the project. Do you have a clear business plan? And does your clear business plan have a clear sense of who your buyers or your purchasers are likely to be? I think the second place that we really spend a lot of time um, is on impact and additionality. One of our goals is to make sure that every project that we has that we have really is meant to address a significant economic constraint. So that's where those investment priorities come in. We're going to be looking at that. Now we invest in a variety of areas. Um, we don't invest in gaming. We don't invest in. Um, things like explosives or anything like that, but tourism, education, healthcare, obviously, housing, there's a lot of opportunities, retail, if you can make the case that there is development impact, job creation, good jobs, high quality paying jobs, that it's providing access to a service that people didn't have access to before, whether that be healthcare or internet or something else. Um, and then I think the other thing that we're going to look at is, are there any adverse potential um, impacts, whether that be in the health, whether there be environmental challenges or health and safety issues associated with the project? 
projects so that we can mitigate against those. Um, and then we're going to look at the foreign policy alignment. I think the biggest one is just ensuring that no project that we invest in um, results in the loss of U.S. jobs. But we'll also be looking to see if a project supports U.S. foreign policy or our national security interests. And then political risk. As you talk about your project, you know, we recognize that we work in tough markets. All of our projects are hard projects. And so one of the things that we're doing, what we look at, look for, is we're not looking for projects where um, there are no challenges, but we are looking for to, to, to ensure that the management team is being very smart about how they plan to address those challenges and that there is a plan in place to deal with, you know, the particular issues that their country or their particular industry is likely to face in the country that they're trying to serve. And then from a management capacity, you know, I often say this, that it is, it is very, very challenging to be a leader in um, a low income, a lower middle income country. And so for that reason, we're really going to be looking at really strong management expertise, whether you've done similar deals, whether you've worked in this country before, whether you've worked in this region before, and we're going to be looking at the bench, like how strong is your entire team? Next slide. I think I won't spend a lot of time here, but I think these are just kind of the key elements that every business plan needs to have. So there's nothing new to see here, but I think as you put your business plans together, I, I would use this as a real reference tool. Go through your business plan, and again, you will, you'll have a copy of this once this event is over, we'll send this out to you. And just make sure that all of these things are checked, that you have information about your company's track record, you have information about you know, the market that you're trying to serve, why you believe you can be competitive, you have information about you know, your shareholders, just so that we know that they are aligned with our focus on really providing patient capital capital and that you have really good financials. That's going to be incredibly important for the work that we do. Next slide. And I won't spend a lot of time here because Lori is going to speak to this, but this is another area that's going to be really important. Your ability to tell the story around the development impact of your project, whether that be the extent to which you create jobs, the extent to which you drive innovation by, you know, mobilizing private capital or what by supporting uh, knowledge transfer. Or the and or the extent to which you're driving inclusion by telling the story about the work that you're doing in this case to um, support um, individuals with disabilities to get access to good paying jobs and opportunities to grow and be integrated into the, the local economy. Next slide. I think that's it. I think this just gives you a case study. Um, it's an example of the kind of information that I'll receive. And again, as I mentioned before in prior pages, use the business plan and the eligibility requirements to help guide you as you put together your business plan and your feasibility study. Um, after this event, I'll be making available 30 minute sessions where if you have, if you're interested, you can send us some information in advance. I'm happy to sit down with you for 30 minutes, talk and kind of get a little bit more sense for what your particular business plan is, and then see whether there's an opportunity to move it forward to an investment officer. Next session. So this closes out this element of the session. I just need to reach out. Lindsay, are we, do we have our special guest available at this point? Um, she is dropped off. I've asked her to come on audio, but she's dropped off. Okay, so given that we are going to continue um, to move forward. I'd like to take this time to interview um, an existing client that we have. Um, Lindsay, if you can bring on Dia Martin and Joe DeSilvio, that would be great. Great. Thank you. Great. And Joe DeSilvio, let's make sure. Joe, can you can you put your video on, please? Joe, your audio is now unmuted. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yes. And but you cannot see me. Is that right? Uh 
Okay, let me figure out how to put my video on. Hmm. I'll see with just audio, please. Yeah, I suggest we continue and I'll, I'll see if okay. I can figure out. All right, perfect. So let me introduce these two individuals. So um, Dia Martin is a managing director. She's been with DFC for a good long period. I won't give, I won't uh, share how long, but she's one of our great investment officers here who has worked on some of the most developmental projects that we've had. And she, I'd like to have, I wanted to provide an opportunity for you to meet her and hear about a project that she supported and underwrote recently called, I think it's called Cataract Fund. I always get it wrong, but I think it's Cataract Bond. Um, and then the other person I want to bring on is Joe DeSilvio. Joe DeSilvio is the manager for that particular program. He works at Volta, Cap, Volta Impact, um, and he's been an amazing partner um, to the to DFC and is doing really awesome development work. I know that your background, I believe, was in edu special education before you worked in this area. And so okay. I want to learn a little bit more about you, Joe. But talk to me first about the work of the Cameroon Cataract Bond. Sure, and, and thanks, Roxanne, and thanks for everyone for having me here. This has been great to, to hear and um, happy to participate. Sorry, my video doesn't seem to be working, but uh, at least you can hear me. Um, so the Cameroon Cataract Bond, I can give you a bit of a quick nutshell overview and then happy to dig into that more if you have additional questions. But essentially, this is a project focused on eliminating avoidable blindness in Cameroon and over time, more broadly in, across Central Africa, uh, through the provision of cataract surgeries with a focus on serving low and middle income populations. So for those that don't know, cataracts are a, a significant source of blindness across the world. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, actually, the rate of blindness and vision impairment overall is twice the global average. 80% of those cases are preventable or treatable, and half of those living with avoidable blindness are affected by cataracts. So it's a huge group uh, and quite a significant problem. And what's so interesting and, and profound about this is it's quite a simple solution that can be easily treated with a simple 20 minute surgery. Uh, this is why we call it avoidable blindness. And the key constraint in a place like Cameroon though, is that you have to have access to affordable quality eye surgeons and facilities, which was not the case in Cameroon nor in most countries across Sub-Saharan Africa. So the project funds uh, an eye hospital called the, uh, the Magrabi ICO Cameroon Eye Institute, or MISI, which is working to address this issue in Cameroon. They have a state-of-the-art facility that they built um, and an internationally recognized staff that provides these high-quality cataract surgeries and, and a host of other eye care services. And now the reason we call this the, the Cameroon Cataract Bond is because the project actually uses a kind of innovative results-based financing mechanism called a Development Impact Bond, or DIB. Uh, which is essentially a pay for, for, for performance loan, uh, where investors like DFC put in upfront uh, risk capital and then donors repay if and when uh, pre-agreed outcomes are achieved. And we'll share some more information on, on uh, this project if you're interested to learn more after the presentation as well. Um, so the bond focuses on, on four key outcomes that are tied to payments. One is the volume of cataract surgeries provided, the quality of those surgeries, the financial sustainability of the hospital, and then another equity target that, that is focused on um, the hospitals reach the poorest segments of the Cameroonian population. And for those, uh, th that group uh, of population, basically the hospital provides subsidized or free surgeries, which are then cross subsidized by full paying patients from wealthier backgrounds. Um, and so in this consortium, we have the eye hospital that's actually implementing this along with two investors, including DFC, um, a few different donors and philanthropic organizations, and then us, Volta Capital, who is kind of the performance manager um, on the bond. So there's a lot more I could say, but I'll pause there for now, Roxanne, because I know we have limited time. We can okay. discuss more Thank further. Thank you so much. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is talk to me about the challenges that an organization like Cameron Cataract Bond would have in being able to get financing. I think it's interesting that you came up with this kind of innovative way to make the financing possible, because I imagine that that's what, what makes it difficult to get people to invest. 
Indeed. Um, yeah, and I think as we as we structured this project, we we were working with a group of outcome funders um, that wanted to 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 fund a project like this, but we needed to find private investors to provide the upfront risk capital, uh, that kind of working capital that you you discussed earlier, Roxanne. And so we approached a number of uh, investors, but most of these, we most of the people we spoke with considered this model just way too risky for a number of reasons. So one, it's a you know a brand new eye hospital in what was considered a difficult investment environment in Cameroon. It, you know, they, no model like this had been done in that environment. Um, the model was considered high risk given it was focused on serving low and middle income populations. And I think also the fact that it was in eye health, this avoidable blindness space is just a sector that most invest investors we spoke with didn't have any experience in and, and were wary of. Um, and I think traditionally most of interventions like this have been um, funded through grant funding, right? And so I think most of the outcome funders, their goal was to do something that actually to prove the investability of this type of model rather than perpetually relying on grant funding, which is inherently unsustainable. And so basically what we did is um, we, we, you know, we wanted to over time prove the investability so we could scale this up and replicate this in new places. Um, and that's what we decided to structure it as a DIB and create this kind of risk sharing framework. Um, and so we approached DFC and uh, we had, as, as Volta, we'd had previous, uh, connections with DIA and, and the DFC team. And so we knew that that this would be a great partner if they would be willing to sign on for a couple of reasons. One is that um, having US DFC, well, it was OPIC at the time, but DFC's you know, name, know-how, expertise on this would increase visibility, really help to create a demonstration effect to make this transaction something that we could, yeah, scale up and replicate later on and increase the impact of it. So we're really grateful that we found a receptive audience here at DFC. And I'm sure Dia can tell you more about her perspectives on the project as well. Go ahead, Dia. Can you? Of course. Um, so first, I, I, thanks uh, for being here. Thanks for having this panel. I think this is a really important conversation and I'm um, ecstatic to be a part of it. And I think what Joe described is exactly why um, it's so important to have organizations like the DFC and for us to do the work that is on our mission. As he mentioned, um, when they reached out to investors initially, it was seen as very high risk based on the location, as well as based on the type of um, healthcare, the idea that it's addressing avoidable blindness, and also the population um, that was being served, the low and middle income population. And it was those very reasons um, that led us, one, to be very intrigued in the project and to be willing to support it through our Portfolio for Impact and Innovation program. And, and this program we refer to as our Pi Square program. And the very idea of this program is to support very innovative, highly impactful projects that can be scaled. So this really fit the criteria for the types of projects that we wanted to support. And I can, I can just expand a little bit on why that's the case. Um, one, as, as Joe already mentioned, it's a very innovative structure looking at impact bonds. And we feel that this structure allows us to work on development challenges that are not traditionally investment opportunities. So it, it turned a developmental challenge that had traditionally be, been funded by grant financing into an investment opportunity that we were able to participate in and mobilize other investors like NetTree Foundation as well as to invest. I think also what's very important, and we didn't get into the details of this, is that our investment is directly tied to social impact performance. So we are getting repaid from the outcome funders based on their ability to deliver high quality surgeries to a diverse income population and also the hospital's ability to be financially sustainable for the long term. So the idea that we can truly link our investment returns to social performance was very attractive. I think also the partners were a great aspect of this project. We'd worked with Volta before, very impressed by Africa Eye Foundation and the sponsors for Africa Eye Foundation and the Mugrabi Hospital's commitment to the project as well as the outcome funders. The outcome funders included Hilton Foundation, Sight Savers, and the Fred Hollows Foundation. So these are foundations 
that were committed to um, addressing the issue of avoidable blindness and committed to the project. So we thought they were very strong partners to work with. As I mentioned before, the additionality, our goal is to mobilize private capital. And we saw in this project the direct ability, direct ability for us to do that by coming in first as an investor and bringing in other investors. And we looked at it for this project, but also looking at it for the impact bond space um, at large, as well as other projects that we work on. And then the final uh, point that I would touch on that Joe mentioned is scalability. So it's very important that we look at different projects that we invest in or investment opportunities and see that they can be scalable and achievable in other markets or that we can expand in the current market. And we saw all the tenants of that in this project. And then finally, just one point I wanted to mention that I also think is really important is we saw this as a project that addressed the ecosystem. So it's not just about providing high quality surgery, but when you dig a deep, bit deeper into the project, there's also the focus on training medical professionals and building medical professionals locally, as well as education, outreach, and awareness to different communities. So the hospital actually goes out to the most vulnerable communities and rural areas and talks about the surgeries and the services that they provide to make sure all communities are, are being served. And I'll just pause there, um, Roxanne. I, I know I gave you an earful. No, 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 this is really great. I think given that, I guess my my final question is, is there you know, any particular impact, um, Joe, that you wanna highlight in addition to the things that have the D has already highlighted, whether it be, you know, as it relates to the broader stakeholder co coalition, who seems to be like a good kind of mix of private and private and, and public, um, or to the implementer or to the individuals that you had the opportunity to serve. I think that's a good way to wrap up this segment. Great, thanks. Yeah, and thanks, Dia and Roxanne. I think that's um, a great question. Um, so I think a couple things I would highlight here about our impact so far. So the the this. Project's been going for over four years now, so we actually have quite a bit of impact data to date. The hospital's done uh, during this project period over 8,600 cataract surgeries um, with very high levels of quality. So they exceeded WHO's quality guidelines and the targets we've set by more than 25 percentage points. And so really providing a service at a level of quality that uh, is unparalleled in the region and really setting itself up as a center of excellence and as as Dia said, you know, becoming this training center and, you know, then being able to prove this model and scale it at, uh, across, you know, new parts of the region is really a key goal long term for this. And they've really demonstrated the ability to do that. They've trained uh, a number of, of new eye surgeons that are going to be working at the hospital itself, as well as others in Cameroon that will be working elsewhere, as well as others across the region. They have, uh, you know, aspiring eye surgeons flying in from, you know, Burkina Faso, Mali, all over the, the West Africa region and the Central Africa region. So um, quite a lot of impact to date. Um, and as Dia mentioned as well, they, they do a lot more than just cataracts, right? They treat all sorts of eye conditions, visibility impairments and needs well beyond just cataracts. And so ad addressing quite a broad set of uh, needs uh, in the region. And so Basically, in year three and year five are when outcome payments were made and when target are, are meant to be made based on targets. And in year three, uh, the hospital successfully met all of its year three targets. And that is in spite of that target falling right in the middle of COVID, a year into the pandemic, which, has, as you can imagine, has had a very significant impact on their ability to do, especially outreach, which Dia mentioned, uh, their ability to go into communities and mobilize rural populations that has been had to be shut down completely for you know quite a, a period of time. So the fact that they're able to reach all their targets in year three is quite significant. Um, they were on track to reach their year five targets as well prior to the pandemic, but this is, of course had a, a profound impact on that. Um, but as a result of that, we've decided to, as a consortium, to extend the project actually and give them more time to adapt and learn based on this kind of huge event that was completely beyond their control which we really appreciate the flexibility and I think speaks to DFC's commitment to impact, right? That to, to doing what, what is right to help this project achieve its original targets and objectives, which it's, it will be on track to do now. Um, so I'll pause there. I think happy to take any, any further questions. And I know Roxanne, we can share some additional materials on 
impact to date, the project, the partners, all that as well. There's been a lot written and, and studied on this as well. Um, so if anybody's interested, we'll share that uh, going forward, but thank you. Yeah, and thank you so much to both of you for your time and for your thoughtfulness and the questions that you've at, that you've um, answered answer just by what you've shared. Um, as you've mentioned, Joe, in when I send out the um, follow up, I will also send out the case study and the links to all of the great information you provided so that people can learn a little bit about, you know, a little bit more about the this particular cataract impact bond, but also just the way that the, the interesting financing mechanism that you use, because this may be something that others want to consider um, for the kind of work that they're doing as well. Um, let's see. Um, I think have we do we have any little any more of an update on our potential speaker? Lindsay. No, she had to go. Okay, so that being the case, um, let's move on to Lori Leonard. So Lori Leonard is going to provide some. Um, guidance right now where she talks a little bit about how we look at impact. Um, we won't be able to go as in depth as we would like, but at least to give you some sense of as you talk about impact, how to tell that story to make sure that you're doing an effective um, uh, to make sure that you're doing uh, an effective job of telling the impact story when you put together your business plan and you reach out to us if you're you're interested for, in financing. Lori, let's get you started. Lindsay, can you make sure that Lori is set up as a panelist and is unmuted? Yes, one moment. Great. I think I you um, should be able to unmute. Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm going to quickly kind of go through um, how DFC looks at development impact and how it kind of fits into our processes. Um, when we converted to the DFC, we implemented a new impact performance framework management pr um, framework called Impact Quotient, which was short for IQ. Um, and I will go through to the next slide here and give you an overview of what the impact quotient does in terms of our process. Great. So, um, this is our development impact management system IQ, which helps us, um, assess the type of potential impact that a project may have when we're considering approval for a project, as well as measures the actual development impact as it is um, go over time as it's in our portfolio. Um, and we look at it through three broad lens, economic growth, inclusion, and innovation. And these are three themes that really spoke to us um, through the BUILD Act in our mandate as a development finance institution that we would strive to achieve. So um, when we do an IQ assessment, we actually assign a development score to a project. Um, and this score enables um, us to better make decisions during the project approval process. It also enables us to classify our projects into highly developmental, developmental, indeterminate, and we're gonna be introducing some other categories in the next fiscal year. Um, the score is a is a um, risk adjusted score, so it not only reflects the potential positive impacts, but also negative impacts that might stem from environmental and social impacts and risks. Um, the score considers the relevance of the impacts within the country context. Um, it creates mechanisms that we can use to maximize the development impact using our technical assistance facility that Roxanne spoke about earlier. Um, and then having a score enables us to assess the development performance of our entire portfolio, as well as each individual project. So we could go to the next slide. 
Um, this next slide talks about how the IQ is incorporated into the project life cycle. So this is a somewhat familiar to with the, um, the stages that Roxanne spoke about earlier, but what we really want to show is how development impact is kind of infiltered throughout this process. So in stage one, when we're looking at pipeline development or sourcing. Um, the origination officers are seeking projects that um, will meet our development strategy that Roxanne spelled out before, as well as the sustainable development goals and that meet our, our development priorities. Um, the second stage is during origination where we take a project to screening. Um, and this is where we identify the potential core development impacts a project may have, as well as the primary risks of that project. Um, during a screening meeting, um, when a project is presented, um, that is where we will provide um, opportunities to raise um, concerns perhaps, or to highlight where we really think a project is going to have a potential good development impact, as well as um, relay lessons that we've learned from previous projects that are similar. Um, and then during stage three is during our due diligence phase. And this is where we would ask um, our clients um, that are proposing a project to complete a questionnaire that speaks to the potential for development impact. And so that, that questionnaire is called the 007. Um, and so every client will complete that and they will ask questions that speak to economic growth, to inclusion, as well as to innovations. Um, and we use that data as a starting point to have a conversation with the client to really dig into the details of what we expect um, the development impact to be. Um, at the same time, we're also speaking with, with the origination teams and with the clients on potential environmental and social risks. And sometimes that involves a call with the client um, or to an actual trip to, to, um, to get a more detailed evaluation or assessment. During stage four is when a project kind of meets all of the, as it, as it continues on through the process, we have the um, approval process where we go through credit committee, um, the development assessment, the IQ score is presented preliminarily um, so that we're ensuring that um, as we're discussing credit risks, that we're also keeping in mind the potential for positive development impacts. We want that discussion to be balanced. Um, and then the conversation continues through our investment committee. If it passes credit committee and then proceeds to investment committee, the IQ score and the assessment is incorporated into that paper. Um, and finally, if it goes to board, um, it, that assessment is also included in there. Um, when a project reaches um, close or to commitment, um, we will have the actual reporting requirements that we would expect for our clients um, to report on in a results table. So these are like five to ten metrics that will be used to uh, that, that will be used to to assess the development performance of a project over time. Um, and so all of those metrics, as well as the definitions, are um, included for reference for the client in the loan agreement. Um, as well as the frequency of when that reporting is due. So in general, we have a reporting requirement at six months after a project is dispersed. And then again, every year in June, we have a more lengthy um, development uh, data collection tool called the um, Development Outcome Survey. That's asked every June and it's done in an electronic format. Um, and so every project will submit that in June of every year so that we can um, continue to collect data and to monitor the development performance of projects over time. Um, and then finally in stage six at about, uh, we will get to maybe a project closure or evaluation stage where we will take a deep dive into a project. Not all projects will be evaluated, but um, some projects will, especially if we're doing like a portfolio review of perhaps um, a sector that we want to look at to get a deep dive on the, the development impacts that we couldn't assess through the data and to get real, the real stories of the project. So similar to what we would do for the cataract eye, we would go in and speak with the investors and to the clients 
and really get a deeper dive into what those impacts have been on a more granular level. Um, we take all the learnings that we, le we learn from performance evaluations and monitoring that we then relay back into the sourcing and the origination in developing strategy, as well as informing, um, you know, better decision making during the project screening site stage. Okay, we can go to the next slide. And the next slide. Okay, so um, you've kind of seen a, 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 uh, this slide before, but again, this is kind of how we do a systematic review of every project that comes through, every investment that comes through um, for approval. Again, we're looking at it through um, three lens, economic growth, inclusion, and innovation, um, and we're scoring projects. So we're basically awarding points for um, particular elements of how they hit on these three pillars. So on the economic growth um, pillar, we're really looking at the scale of impacts. So the higher the scale, the more people that will be reached, the higher the score. For inclusion, where we're, um, we're measuring the beneficiaries of the projects, um, the higher the percentage of the beneficiaries that are from um, marginalized populations or disadvantaged populations, the higher the score. So it could be a very small deal, but if it's very inclusive, it will get a high points for inclusion. And then innovation looks at the market and energy diversification and demonstration effects. So again, taking the example from the cataract eye example, that would be the training that's provided to the nurses and doctors, all of that where there's learning that's going outside the scope of the project, perhaps to the broader community would get points there. On um, the next level of assessment, we look at how relevant the impacts are in the, to, to, in the country's context. So. Will the project's impacts help address a critical development challenge? If so, then yes, the project is meaningful and it gets a higher score. And then the third level would be looking at risks. And this is where points actually could be deducted if a project has significant environmental and social development risks, then we would um, be taking points off until those are mitigated um, if they can be mitigated. Um, and then finally, we look at opportunities. This leverages our technical assistance um, facility where we can perhaps um, take measures to increase the positive impacts for employees, the environment, and or lo local communities. Can go to the next slide. I wanted to give a little bit of a deeper dive into the inclusion pillar. Um, this is an example. This is just one of the three pillars. But um, really what we're looking for for inclusion is the extent to which a project serves underrepresented populations in the host country. So this could be um, providing goods or services to those individuals. Um, and the underrepresented populations may include low income, women, women owned enterprises, smallholder farmers, youth, people with disabilities, indigenous peoples, refugees, and ethnic and religious minorities. That's by just by example, there could be other populations within the context of the country that we that isn't listed, but we do provide um, flexibility for um, investors to specify what populations they will be serving if it's not listed there. Um, we're not only looking at um, whether a project um, provides goods or services to those individuals, we also look at their workforce. So we also collect data on um, the type of people that they hire in their companies. Um, and we, again, we track that on the form that I mentioned for the 007 as well as the 008. Um, we also look at supply chains and sometimes um, that's really where the impact will be will be if they're going to be procuring goods and services from underrepresented populations. Um, and so that also can be, be awarded points. Um, other indicators are investment in SMEs um, and investment in underserved geographies within a co country. Um, the final point here, the indicator is bonus points for inclusive governance. And so this is an opportunity for um, projects that have diversity or aim to have diversity in its leadership team and or have, have voluntary initiatives that aim to engage the local community employees and other stakeholders in decision making. So if there is a strategy or an initiative in place in the in the company that really promotes inclusive governance, then, then we can get bonus points for that. 
Um, and I think the final slides um, speaks to some of the um, specific metrics that we ask on our forms. And these are um, the metric alignment is we use all of our metrics that we use are our standardized metrics that other impact investors use or that other development finance institutions use. So this is where it aligns where that metric is aligned to. Um, so you can see here some of the metrics that we would ask on all of our forms, not only on the 007 when we're looking at projected impacts, but also on the development outcome survey um, each year where we're actually looking at real impacts um, over time. So that is, you can, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but um, other than that, I will hand it back to um, Roxanne. So we're gonna take this time, we don't have a lot of time left, but we do want to ask and to give you the opportunity to ask questions if you have any. Um, we've given you a lot of information, shared a lot with you, but if there are questions that you have, I'm gonna open it up. Please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A section or in the chat. All right, so I don't see a lot of questions. One of the questions that usually we get relates to are there, you know, are there, what are the minimums in terms of what we'll invest in? And what I would say is, I think the biggest thing that I would say is that um, in terms of lessons learned, I think the biggest thing that I would say is that, you know, we invest in a variety of industries, but as Lori mentioned, we wanted to make sure we spent a little bit more time here. We're really looking at the development impact on the project. And so if there's, if you're able to really tell that story as well as tell the story about how the project will be able to pay for itself and how the project, you know, can be, can kind of be profitable, that's gonna be really critical. But if you can tell the development story, I think that's gonna be very, very important for us. So that's number one. I think the second thing that's really important is we're gonna, we spend a lot of time asking people up to share a little bit about their management expertise. So to the extent that you can tell the story about the um, how you know strong your team is either in doing this kind of transaction or similar transactions, the extent to which you have worked in um, this particular country or in this region, the extent to which you understand the regulatory issues um, that are associated with your particular industry, um, all of those things are going to be really important. Questions. I don't see too many questions here. I think the other thing that I would also share is in terms of minimums. We tend to look for projects that are either at, at the very least 1 million dollars. I've even pushed it up a little bit more just because um, we're finding that um, given the demand, we are finding that there's a lot of projects that are, you know, that we end up needing to do, you know, look at kind of slightly larger products projects maybe that's 4 million or 5 million but ideally um, we would we're happy to look at projects that are 4 million but they do have to tell the story of development impact um, and and indicate that those projects are likely to be very productive and likely to um, be highly developmental and so that's why i've spent so much time um, and that's why it's been great to have Lori on to really talk you through the elements of development and you'll have this information so that as you put together your feasibility plan and as you put together your business plan you'll you know have the information that you need um, with the limited time that we have, since we don't have questions, I wanna make sure that number one, I thank you all for your time and your participation and do wanna make sure that I thank a couple people, Charles Collette from the State Department, Catherine Guernsey, if you all can just come on so I can, we can sh see you and say hello. 
and just thank you. So both of these individuals were kind of instrumental in looking at looking for individuals who could participate in this event. So I want to thank you for that. Um, also want to thank, um, I guess it's. Let's see, I see some here. Simon Brown, I'd like to thank you as well as he's not on. Uh, he's not able to participate, but Esteban Trumbull, who is from the International Labor Organization. We're all instrumental in trying to build out the invitation list because it's very hard to find companies that we can reach out to that are really focused on issues related to disability inclusiveness. So, again, want to thank you. I will be sending out a follow up note um, with kind of key information about. Oh, how do we begin the process? Who do we reach out to? Okay, that's a great question. Um, and I see another question here, but. Um, just want to thank you again for if you take for your time in terms of beginning the process. I will send out at the end of this um, a spreadsheet that you can fill out with just kind of some key details on your particular transaction. Then we can schedule a kind of 30 minute conversation and during that 30 minute during that 30 minute conversation. We can I can talk you through the details of your business plan, um, kind of give you some guidance on kind of next steps. And then if this turns out to be something that you, if you can provide that information, then we can refer you to an investment officer who can move this forward. Um, another question that I see here. Then can you mute? Oh, okay, someone has another question. Great. I think that's everything. 